Hello and welcome. My name is Hunter Christensen, and you are listening to Prompted, the official podcast of the writing prompt section on Reddit. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to the future, 2016. Isn't that crazy? I mean, 2015 just flew by, personally, for me. I don't know where the heck it went. It just went like that. And I feel like people say that every year, but I'm kind of scared at how quickly 2015 just disappeared. And I feel like that's a trend in my life, is that every single year they just get faster and faster. And I'm afraid that, you know, next year is going to feel like it was just a day, and it kind of scares me a little bit. But anyways... It's a new year. This is also an exciting time. But I've been thinking a lot about time and time's role in each of our lives. And I think as human beings, we're obsessed with time. We think about time constantly. We use it to measure our everyday lives and activities, our history. I think like we're the only creatures that have history, that even measure it. And it's just fascinating how important of a role time plays that we just all take for granted. So naturally, the stories that we tell as humans revolve a lot around time and the concept of time. And writing prompts is no exception to this. If you go on to writing prompts, you'll see a ton of prompts and stories about time. So for today's show, I've decided to revolve it around the theme of time. So each story will have an aspect of time, whether it's time travel, history, time-based superpowers, people trying to live longer. Time is all around us, and our stories are full of it. So the first story we have is a classic time travel prompt, and it is written in response to this prompt. You time travel back to 1348 accidentally bringing your phone. About to take a photo, you notice one available Wi-Fi network. Sorcery! My eyes snap up from my phone. A short, fat, bald man was pointing at me, mouth agape, revealing the few rotten teeth he had. He was wearing a brown... what did they call it? Oh, yeah, a, a tunic. And much like all of the denizens of this quaint village... He was caked in mud. She's casting her spell, she is. A mob was starting to form, and at least three people had pitchforks. I think I might have happened upon the single most stereotypical mob in all of history. Either way, I'm pretty sure they want... Burn the witch! Off with her head! Cast her in irons and throw her in the lake! Wanted me dead. Whoa, whoa, come on guys, this isn't sorcery, I said as I held up my phone, this is just a 4S. The crowd went silent for a second, and then quickly resumed their demands for the removal of my head. Oh, come on, that would have killed 600 plus years into the future. The mob surrounded me. A couple of guys with swords had joined the crowd and were making their way towards me. I had to get out of here quickly, but there was no way out. I was completely surrounded by the villagers. But then, I had an idea. If they thought I was a sorcerer, then why not cast some spells? I opened my phone's camera, turned on the flash, held up my phone, and took a picture. Just as I thought, the small light on the phone was enough to send the villagers reeling. I took my chance and ran. I ducked and weaved my way from villagers trying to grab me until a large villager stopped me. I went to take another picture right in his face when... In the top right corner of my phone, a Wi-Fi signal appeared. In 1348? How? I felt the man's hand grab my arm when I instinctively took the picture. My eyes! He fell towards the ground and I ran for it, checking my phone for the Wi-Fi signal. Three bars? That must be nearby. I ducked into an alleyway and ran towards a hut at the end of the street. The door was made of rotting wood and I couldn't see any semblance of a handle to force it open. The mob had filtered itself into the alleyway. I was backed in the corner and the bald man had made his way to the front. It's time.
time to show you what we do to witches, girly, he said, revealing his rotten teeth in a sinister grin as the mob hurled obsolete obscenities at me. This is it, I thought to myself, and checked my phone one last time for the signal. Four bars. It had to be right here. I looked at the mob and back to the door, and in a last-ditch effort threw myself into the door. The rotting wood gave way, and I went crashing onto the floor. I sat up, trying to regain my composure, and... Was Dave Matthews' band playing? Good tidings, and welcome to this fair Starbucks. Does thou wish to try our autumn blend? That story was written by Bernedict Cumbersnat. Our next story involves two characters who want to try and cheat time and live forever. Here's the prompt. Two people discover a fountain of youth. The problem is that upon drinking the water, you turn back into an infant. The two decide to take turns raising each other in order to live forever, until one day, one of them decides to break this agreement. No, please. She pushed the vial away from her lips, her thin and wrinkly hand shaking. Why? I asked. I... I'm so tired, dear. She sighed and then continued. My flesh is tired. What do you mean? The other ones. My other lives. I've come to realize they're not really me. I've read their diaries. I've memorized the formula. You raised me, and I made you young again. I raised you as though you were my own child. But there's no personal continuity between these versions of us and the ones that came before. There were tears in her eyes now. This is not immortality. Just a series of deaths. A long line of lives we cannot remember. But I swear I can feel the weight of every loss in my bones. She put her hand on mine. I want to sleep. But what about our deal? I asked. What about us? You'll have to find a new one. It will be easy to find somebody willing, but harder to find someone to trust. I nodded. Now leave me, please. I will have my peace. At last. I slowly backed out of the room, and I whispered goodbye as I closed the door. Walking down the hallway, I returned the vial of cyanide into my pocket. I obviously wouldn't need it for this one. That was a first. She'd almost figured everything out, that stupid old hag. She must have been depressed. Whatever. That made things easier for me. Of course the formula lets you preserve your memories. It would be pointless otherwise. The only reason my partner couldn't remember her past life was because she hadn't lived one. Neither had the one before her. I already had the next child prepared. I would raise her as my daughter. Then she would raise me as her son. Then I would kill her. Rinse and repeat. A god doesn't share his throne. That story was written by Svart Some Silver. Our next story also involves two characters who have discovered the ability to cheat time. It goes like this. John can see 10 seconds into the future. Barry can go back in time 10 seconds. They fight. It took nearly 13,000 tries, 36 hours without sleep, reliving the same moment again and again, but Barry had his revenge. It was nothing. Nothing like reliving the 10 seconds from the moment he found his wife bleeding to death on the ground. Nothing like the desperation he felt as he tried again and again to staunch the bleeding from her neck, to find the bandages, to put her at ease, to choose his final words to her as her eyes dimmed and closed. He had kissed her, held her head, spoken softly to her, 
told her it was going to be alright when he knew for a fact it was not, over and over again for nearly three days. He knew exactly who to look for. His spat with John had been ongoing for years now, ever since he had proposed using their powers for crime. Barry bid him good riddance, and John, angry and scared of the only human being who could counter his power, had lashed out. Barry found John the next day, a red rage blinding him as he walked up to John sitting at the bar. John smiled as Barry approached, knowing precisely what would happen in the next ten seconds. Barry swung at him, as hard as he could, but John dodged as ever. Rewind. Barry swung again. John dodged. The smirk on his face remained. Rewind. Barry swung again, this time running full pelt at John. John knew what was coming, but also knew he couldn't react fast enough. Barry clipped him. Rewind. Faster this time. Barry followed through with another punch. Finally, after a thousand tries, Barry could see the smirk disappear from John's face as he knew this time his opponent's punch would connect and shatter his jaw. Satisfaction. Rewind. This time with a threat. I'm going to kill you, John, over and over. John showed fear on his face. Maybe this was still satisfaction. Rewind. A heavier insult. A feint. Barry flew so hard at John he unbalanced himself and missed. Rewind. 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 Over and over again, falling a little harder to the floor, landing a little closer. John swerved, stepped back, kicked him in the face as Barry went down. Barry's face was never bruised at the beginning of the 10 seconds, but by the 23rd hour, he had his nose broken by John 30 times. He had lost over 200 teeth and swallowed them twice. Barry had learned about the butterfly effect. Little changes led to bigger changes over time. Every time he approached John, he fell differently, uttered a new insult, changed intonation, shouted, whispered. For 10 seconds to be so different, the butterfly had to be perfect. Finally, after the last rewind, the perfect 10 seconds. He got the insult right. His eyes shifted to the bar where John's cutlery was, a subtle hint. He threw himself at John and missed, falling. John, a smile on his face again, picked the knife up from his plate of steak and rammed it between Barry's shoulder blades. Barry didn't know what would happen in the next 10 seconds, which he thought strange, considering the intimate knowledge of the previous 10. But what he did know was that 65 seconds ago, or was it 36 hours, he had called the police, an anonymous tip-off to come to the bar. With an average response time of two minutes in this area, even John couldn't see he would spend the rest of his life in jail. That story was written by Alby13. Elena Howell has our final story on our theme today, and in this story we explore a world in which time travel is actually possible for the population as a whole. And the prompt that inspired this story is this. Time travel is real, and time tourists tend to show up in large numbers around major historical events. One day, billions of time tourists are in ships above the city, quietly waiting. It was 9.32am on a Thursday morning when the day trippers appeared. I say appeared because there is no other term for it. There was no loud flash or silent approach. There were no disturbances in the light cloud cover above, nor in the activities of the busy city below. One moment the skies were bright, blue and clear, and the next they were full of semi-opaque spherical objects that cast long, dark shadows across the asphalt streets and surrounding countryside. At a glance, I estimated several hundred thousand craft. It turns out I was low by a few factors of magnitude, but that doesn't matter. Their numbers change every time I go back to Thursday at 9.32am. Different slices on the spectrum get distorted due to foot traffic. It's kind of like how paths get worn in the grass near important monuments. We had caught glimpses of day trippers before. You know the sort. Grainy footage from the 1920s of a woman calmly walking down the street while talking on a smartphone. Logs of bright lights following Columbus on his historic voyage. Photos of Jay-Z hanging out in the 1930s. 
Most of us categorise such fluff alongside pictures of Bigfoot and visions of the Virgin Mary in a piece of toast. Actually, I used to give more credence to the toast, because at least you could fetch a few dollars on eBay for a properly burned piece of bread. For similar reasons, I didn't pay much attention when NASA put out a press release claiming that they were not nearing completion of a warp drive. I may have thought it was a bit odd that they spoke up specifically to state that they had not made a major discovery, but most stuff NASA says falls somewhere in between them Virgin Mary and Bigfoot on my scale. In retrospect, or looking forward depending on where you sit on the spectrum, they were being quite honest. The guys at JPL had not made progress on a functional warp drive. What they had created was much more transformational than that. Apparently, one unexpected side effect of bending space-time around an object is that it leaves threadbare spots in the fabric of space-time itself. Imagine a circular patch of loosely woven cloth being folded back upon itself to touch all edges to the exact centre of the circle. Gaps would become apparent between threads at the furthest outward bend of the fabric. Those gaps were the key to day-tripping. Though NASA had not found a way to encapsulate a craft within the centre of the cloth, they had inadvertently left large enough holes in the bends to let future pioneers brave their way through. At 9.31am on a Thursday morning, a JPL engineer hit enter on a keyboard, initiating a test of a potential new propulsion system in a complete vacuum. Just like that, all at once, time travel was invented and became ubiquitous within the blink of an eye. When the world looked skyward at 9.32am, they saw a vast swath of observers from all points in time, present, past and future. They arrived to view the birth of a new civilization and a new way of life. They came to witness the origins of a new society with new structures of government, a revolution in scientific understanding and the simultaneous conception and death of new and old religions. This moment in time was, as far as we've seen on the spectrum, the most important instant in the history of all creation. Every day forward had some day tripper in view, though they mostly stayed just out of reach. As the United Nations began writing governance for such travel, it became clear that travellers would not be allowed to interact directly with natural inhabitants of other spectrum bands. We would be limited to contact with people from our own slice of time. At first, world bodies sought to limit access to time travel, but that proved a fruitless endeavour. It was postulated that due to the sheer number of observers present in the world around us, that at some point in the future, day-tripping had been open to the public. After many esoteric and mostly philosophical debates by lawmakers, they decided to just start by opening travel to everyone and regulating the entry and ingress points. It became much like any other form of international travel. Licensed tourists selected a destination, a slice on the spectrum, and as long as it was sometime after 9.32am on Thursday, they were allowed to observe. The craft was remotely operated and would automatically return to its origination point and slice at precisely 24 hours relative to the tripper. That is actually how they got their name. It turns out trips like the ones captured on film in the last century were restricted by the time they took place in the future. Nobody was allowed to travel outside of a craft, and nobody was allowed to go back before 9.32am on Thursday, even if there was a viable gap to pass through. Sometimes exceptions were made in the early days. Jay-Z got to head to 1939 for a photo shoot on a stoop, and the lady with the smartphone was actually his agent. She just got lost 11 years away on a Groucho Marx set. As to Columbus lights, those were really just torch-bearing native fishermen in canoes travelling between nearby islands. That's what the sanctioned UN Travel Bureau forensic team told us anyway. I guess not all gaps lead back to 932 after all. Anyway, I finally got my licence renewed and am headed back to Thursday. I want to take another look from the top down. I hope I see me looking back, wondering what the future is going to bring again. That story was written by Jedson. So two episodes ago, we had an exclusive podcast prompt, which was an inanimate object comes to life at an inappropriate time. 
And as promised, we said that we would read a few of those submissions. They were all great. Thank you so much to those that wrote in a response to that prompt. Uh, And now we have Ryan Kinder here to read a handful of uh, some of those stories that were submitted. And we're going to continue to have an exclusive prompt for each episode of the podcast. So after we read those stories, we are going to share some exciting news about that. So stick with us. Here's Ryan. This first story is by SAFC Fan 1. The bin lay just ahead of us, carrying her in my arms at the time, her cold and fragile body providing no warmth to mine. I felt the processor inside her suddenly heat up, her body vibrating. I had to tilt her upwards. All I could see was the missing keys and a cracked monitor. Why? Her voice was distorted. I couldn't bear it. I dropped the laptop in the bin and didn't look back. This next story is by Pico Neeks. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. She'd been crouching by the pride open skylight for hours, waiting for the all clear. They're down. You sure? Mostly. She rappelled into the museum, the dark closing in as the only safe route outside shrank further and further above her. She reached the bottom, her hand inches away. Oh, shit! She heard in her earpiece. What? No time. Get out! A hum began to fill the room as pairs of red eyes lit up around her. This next story is by Seawall81. My pen whisks across the tablet, fueled by caffeine and the dread of a deadline fast approaching. I take a sip of my coffee and examine what I've done. The panel contains a different scene than what I meant to draw. One of horses and meadows instead of superheroes, as per the storyboard. As I stare at the screen in confusion, the pen tool writes in cursive. You never ask me what I want to draw. So, Ryan, how are you? I am as well as I can be. That's the answer I tend to give everybody. It just just Mm. shuts them up. It's a very honest answer, I suppose. (laughs) And how about you? How are you, Hunter? I'm doing really well, just recovering from the holidays. So tell (laughs) us about uh, what we're doing this week for our exclusive podcast prompt. Well, we... (laughs) We have something delicious cooked up for you today. Mm. Let me tell you. Mmm, delicious. Scrumptious, even. We have a contest, the first ever. A contest? So, like, prizes and whatnot? Prizes, yeah? Prizes, three prizes, three $25 prizes. Each three stories that will get read on the show will get 25 whole dollars. How's that? How's that hit you? Oh, that it sounds amazing. $25? I could use an extra $25. Yes, $25 payable by PayPal or Amazon gift card. Uh, or you could have us donate it. Um, in the past, in the writing prompt subreddit, we've had people who say, I, I don't even want the winnings. Could you donate it to such and such a charity? And we're always agreeable to doing that. Hmm. Well, brilliant. So if I want the $25 and I'm listening to this podcast... What do I need to do to get it? Okay, here's what you do. Very simple. You would go to prompted.reddit.com. That's right, prompted.reddit.com. Isn't that easy to remember? So easy. (laughs) And you would look at the top of the subreddit, and you'll see a thread to post your submission. And what will happen is you will write a story based on the prompts that I will tell you in just a minute. And we will pick the three best stories of our own personal opinion based on things like upvotes and 
how well it will sound for the podcast, make it entertaining, uh, make it good for one person to read. It, it should be in a single voice. And here is the prompt. You ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. You are to write an email that turns your character's life upside down. That's right. An email that turns your character's life upside down. Now, that could be anything, any genre, what have you, but it should just be one singular email. And uh, it, it's just totally up to you. It, you. The constraints are up to you. The length is up to you. But remember, it, it doesn't have to be a, a novel length. It can, <laughs> remember that we're going to be trying to read this on the show that's like, what is it, a half an hour show? I don't even remember. Yeah, 25 minutes, half hour, that's what we go for. That's right. So remember that we're going to have to read three stories. So keep that in mind and, and don't try to overwhelm us with length. But uh, the length is pretty much up to you aside from that. And you would just go there, just submit your story, and you are all set. And we will inform you if, you are, if yours is one of the stories that we choose to read. Awesome. And then we'll read them the following podcast. Yes, I look forward to reading them too. By the way, this came from the book 1,000 Awesome Writing Prompts, available on Amazon. That's right. You heard it. With over 100 five-star reviews. Is that a good advertisement? Oh, that sounds good. How many reviews? Over 100 five-star reviews. Ooh, that is a lot. That's three digits. That's a lot of five that stars. That is three digits. It's a good book. If you want more prompts, go check it out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our show. Thank you so much for joining with us. We will return in two weeks' time with a new theme and new stories selected from the workings of the Writing Prompts community. Make sure to go to prompted.reddit.com to respond to this week's exclusive prompt so that you can win $25. This show is produced and edited by myself, Hunter Christensen. Thank you so much for Elena Howell for reading for us. Thank you again to Ryan Kinder, the founder of Writing Prompts, for appearing on the show. And thank you so much to all of the writers who contributed to the stories that were read. If you like the show, please share it. We want to take over the world. That's all I got for you. Stay creative. <laughs>